as we all know, surgeons make mistakes just like everybody else. The problem is you make a mistake in surgery, it can escalate. It can cause serious, sometimes life-threatening complications. Why do we make mistakes? That's going to be kind of the focus tonight. How do they happen? How can you, how can you try so hard? How can you study for so many years, practice for so many years, and still make mistakes? There's kind of four things that I, I go through in my process for trying to avoid surgical complications on, on pretty much every patient, pretty much every day. These are things that, that I kind of go through. Um, the first one is use a surgical checklist. Um, this has been around the human world for about 10 years, and the benefits that have been reported are just staggering how it can improve your complication rates. Um, number two, try to be aware of common mental errors, or what's called mental traps, when I'm working up a case or when I'm thinking about a case. Um, we'll go over the four most common uh, mental errors in the medical field. And I think you'll find that these are things that pretty much we all do kind of every day, kind of fall into these traps. I did it a little bit earlier today, actually. Um, number three, if you're having difficulty during the surgery, like intra-op, um, I think you'll find that to solve that problem, almost always all you have to do is just increase your exposure. So that's more of a, like a practical, um, technical thing. And we'll go over several ways to do that, how to increase your exposure, make that surgery technically way easier. And then the last thing, number four, is review. Sometimes the reason you're having a complication with the current case is because you didn't learn from your past case. Um, you need to follow your cases out, evaluate the results, critique what you did, get better. To kind of sum up the, the whole point of this talk, the reason we're all here is to get better, right? So, so that we can help animals, we can be better at that. Um, not just as individuals, everybody comes from their own practice, but, but as a community. MVS is just an extension of you, of your, of your hospital. Um, and so the way we get better is to not just share our successes, but also share our failures so that we can kind of all learn from them. And I know that can be a very uncomfortable thing. Let's talk about your worst day. Let's talk about that patient that didn't go well. It's tough to do, but it's really important to do. Um, as we go through this list, there's a lot of great surgeons that I'll quote or, or use from their, their research, and all of them agree. To get better, to be great, you have to admit your failures. And so that's what we're going to go through a lot of that tonight. And so if you feel uncomfortable doing that, i got plenty of failures, and I'm going to bring up a lot of them, okay? In 1975, there was a study on medical fallibility, also known as medical errors. Um, and it stated that there are two main sources for mistakes in the medical world. The first one is ignorance, right? That means we just didn't know any better. We have a limited understanding of how things work. Um, and historically, this was the main cause or the major cause of medical complications or metal, medical failures, right? We didn't know what anesthesia was. We didn't have antibiotics. We didn't know to wash our hands, all those kind of things. We just didn't know any better. Um, but today, we have a much better understanding of how things work, uh, the various uh, body systems, the diseases, um, how to treat them. Um, in fact, today, the, the biggest problem is we probably have too much information. There's just way too much depth to, to everything. An example is, I wanted to be James Harry. Like, I wanted to be mixed animal. I wanted to do everything. And just, ima just the amount of information that you would have to have just in your head at all times is just unbelievable. I started with that, and now all I do is surgery on dogs. And I still struggle to keep up with the technology, the new, the new research that's out there. There's just too much information um, for one person to, to be able to know it all. And so that leads us to the second cause of failures. And this is definitely the, the bigger reason these days. It's called ineptitude. That means the knowledge exists, but we fail to apply it correctly. Does that make sense? So it's out there. We just didn't do it right. A synonym for, for ineptitude is, is negligence. Everybody heard that word before? That's not a good word. Um, some examples of ineptitude uh, in the human world. Since 1846, we know that you need to wash your hands before and after seeing patients to prevent spread of infection or spread of disease. But there are recent studies that show that doctors and, doctors and nurses don't actually wash their hands every time. They freely admit it. There's also research showing about 2 million people a year 
get infections in the hospital setting. And it's most likely because somebody didn't do something as simple as just wash their hands. That's called ineptitude. Maybe a more practical example is um, we all know that driving uh, or texting while driving increases the risk of getting a car accident. We all know this. It's on the little thing as we drive down 440. How many of us text when we drive? I try not to, but I certainly am guilty of doing it. Why, why do we do this? The knowledge exists. We just don't apply it correctly. One of my favorite authors um, and speakers is Dr. Atul Gawande. He's a human surgeon, um, part of the kind of the, the Harvard Medical Group. Um, and a lot of what we're going to talk about tonight is taken from uh, his research, his presentations, and, and his books. He's got several books out there that I highly recommend. Just, they're just interesting books. Ten years ago, Dr. Gawande, he was asked by the World Health Organization to work on a project to decrease surgical deaths around the world. What, what a task. At that time, so 10 years ago, just in the U.S., we had about 150,000 Americans die in surgery each year. They started out trying to figure out how to, how to get those deaths down just around the world. He mentioned in, in his book what, what they would typically do is just pour money into new technology, better training for the surgeons. What they found was with the research that actually about half of those sur surgical deaths were caused by avoidable human error. We didn't need, need new technology. The surgeons didn't need better training. They just needed to change their perioperative routine. It's pretty crazy. So they went about trying to figure out how to, how to change surgeons' routines just across the board around the world. And what they ended up doing is they went and consulted with two other professions. Uh, professions that um, have been very successful in minimizing error in, in complex, dangerous environments. And they talked with the construction industry and they talked with the aviation industry. For the building and, or construction uh, industry, uh, we can build skyscrapers taller and taller, right? But the risk of one of those buildings falling is getting less and less. Planes become more complicated to fly, <coughs> yet the odds of being killed in a flight somewhere around 1 in 29 million. Pretty crazy numbers, really low, you know, minimal error. And what they found, both of these industries consult a checklist before completing any task or making any critical decisions. Doesn't matter how experienced the engineers are or the pilots, they always consult a checklist before making any major decisions. And so what they did was they just, they made a surgical checklist. Um, they introduced it in eight hospitals around the world uh, the hospital in New Zealand, the U.S., London, Tanzania. Um, it wasn't uh, just in the U.S. It was all around the world, different socioeconomic classes, just, just a real varied um, population of hospitals. After three months, the checklist was used on 8,000 patients, and the major complication in these, in these hospitals decreased by an average of 36%. Deaths due to surgery decreased by an average of 47% in all of these hospitals. It wasn't just one, it wasn't just the rural hospitals, it wasn't just the best hospitals, all of them. Those results were published in 2009 in the New England uh, Journal of Medicine, and they've been verified again and again with, with these additional studies. Uh, the checklist is now a routine procedure, a routine protocol in hospitals around the world. There's like 4,000 hospitals uh, that use it in 122 countries. We'll kind of just keep going through this, but how do they make the checklist? It turns out that there is a science to making a good checklist. And so what they did is they met with um, some folks at Boeing. Boeing um, in the avia aviation industry, they have to make about a thousand checklists a year for their pilots. They have to keep updating them. And so there's, there's really four key components to making a, a good checklist, because you can make a bad checklist that doesn't help at all. To make a good checklist, the first thing, it needs to have a clear pause point. This is a particular point where you know when to pause and complete the checklist. As it relates to surgery, they've kind of come up in, in their checklist, they kind of have three, three parts. One is before induction of anesthesia. The other one is before you make the incision. And then the third one's before the surgeon walks out of the room. Those are the three pause points where everybody just stops and just runs through a checklist, make sure nothing was missed. Number two, it needs to be speedy. They found that each section of the checklist has to be less than 60 seconds. Otherwise, it's just annoying or distracting to the whole operation. And it should only include about five to nine what they call killer items. 
These are items that if, were mi if they're missed, they would negatively impact the patient's life. Number three, it should just be, everything on the checklist should just be a supplement to your existing knowledge. So the checklist is not a step-by-step -step guide how to do the surgery. It's not a scenario where you can just turn your brain off and just be a robot and do the surgery. Each item should just be a short, concise reminder that triggers a familiar routine that you normally do. It just prevents you from forgetting to do it. Did we count the sponges before we close the abdomen? That kind of thing. The fourth is that it should be field tested and continually updated. Uh, it should be a living document. When you have a, a failure that wasn't prevented by the checklist, then you add something to that checklist to help you pre prevent that failure in the future. And what they found was, interestingly, after that study came out, they had a 36% you know, decrease in complications. The hardest thing about having the, getting the, the checklist to spread was just getting surgeons to use it. Pretty amazing. If it was a drug that decreased the complication rates across the world by 36%, everyone would be interested. Everybody would want to buy it. Everybody would buy stock in it. It would be the biggest thing ever, but it was just a very basic, boring checklist. And that can be a difficult thing for a surgeon's ego. It's difficult for, surge, or difficult for doctors, and especially surgeons, to understand that we are flawed. We have unreliable memories. Um, despite top-notch training, years of experience, we can still overlook small details, important details, forget steps. Um, the world is just too complex, especially with surgery. You need multiple people um, involved in the course of care. You have people that uh, don't talk to each other. It's just a recipe for having complications. That's the beauty of the checklist. It's a tool that can make everyone better, even the experts. All right. So how does a checklist decrease surgical complications and deaths? How does it actually do that? There, there are several explanations. It's, it's basically multifactorial. Most surgeries have one difficult part associated with them. You think of a spay, and you're thinking about, I got a tie off the ovarian pedicle. There's like one thing that you're thinking, if I can get through that, I got it, right? We've been successful. But in reality, to be effective, for that patient to do well, you must be able to complete all of the tasks, all of the details. You gotta remember to give them antibiotics. You gotta make sure the instruments are sterile. You gotta send them home with an e-collar. All those little details play into the end result. So the checklist is specifically designed for that type of thing, minimizing missing those, those little details. The pause points, kind of a unique thing, they require the whole surgery team to communicate with each other um, and use teamwork. Kind of an, an interesting aspect is they had, the way they ran this in the human hospitals is they had one of the nurses read off, read off the checklist. Bless you. And they had everyone in the operating room introduce themselves. So I, I realized that the human operating rooms are probably a little different than what we're used to. Sometimes they'll have folks coming together for the first time for just that one surgery. Maybe everybody is, they're not familiar with each other. But the principle of having everyone involved and giving everyone a voice is definitely relatable to our world. How many of you have technicians or assistants that are afraid to speak up when they see you break sterility? Maybe I should say, how many of you are aware that you have technicians and assistants that are afraid to speak up when you break sterility or you miss something, right? That, that's a real thing. Um, it is important to create an environment where your staff can speak up, where, where you can allow them to actually support you. So, so overall, success is a, it's a group effort. You need to create that environment. I would say here, and this happened probably five times a day, I don't know, but it's a rare day when one of our staff doesn't pick up on me missing something. I forgot to do something, some critical thing. Oh yeah, we, we did this intestinal surgery, we were also gonna take a liver biopsy or something, I just totally forgot about it. And I think it's pretty, pretty understandable. I think we all have very busy lives, very busy days, um, and there's just so many distractions. So there needs to be some kind of mechanism to remind you of the important things. And that's where the checklist really steps in and can allow you to, to just make sure everything is in order. This is an example I, I wrote out. I'm in the operating room. <clears throat> I just finished resecting some intestines on a dog's septic abdomen. Um, we're about to close and the dog is doing horribly under anesthesia. I'm splitting my time between 
uh, doing the actual procedure and then split my time between troubleshooting why the dog's so hypotensive. Calfee calls back and says, there's a GDV, just came in. You need to rearrange your day and fit this GDV in. Um, then our criticalist, Dr. Long, calls back. She says, the dog you cut last night is doing terrible. What would you like to do? Would you like me to call the owners? And then our front desk calls back and says, we have an owner on the phone asking for an update on a patient, a patient that we haven't operated yet. Would you li what would you like me to tell them? And by the way, my daughter vomited this morning. I wonder if she's at the doctor. There's just so many things that get in the way, and that is how you forget to count the sponges before you close the abdomen, right? You just totally forget about it. Anybody have days like that all the time? It's just like the normal, I feel like. The surgical checklist made it to the veterinary world in 2016. There's a study by Bergstrom, and they evaluated the use of, they used a modified um, World Health Organization surgical checklist, and they used it in the small animal surgery world. Uh, it was a prospective study. They used 530 client-owned dogs and cats. But they did kind of two parts. They did the first 300 cases without a checklist, and their complication rate was around 17%. And then the next 220 cases, they used the checklist, and the complication rate was around 7%. And I realize I, I tend to like really find the terribleness of every study, and, and this is not a control study. There's different surgeries, different complication rates. I, I get that. But it did show a 10% drop in the complications. And it's got a ton of cases. It's just interest, interesting. So um, what they recommended or I should say what they concluded was that the frequency and severity of the post-operative complications um, was significantly decreased. Um, they also found, as far as specific complications, uh, significance with surgical site infections and wound healing were much decreased in the checklist study compared to those without a checklist. We, we read that article here, and we decided to introduce the surgical checklist here at NVS about a year ago. Um, on the back, I think, of your handouts, is the, the checklist that we use here. And we'll just kind of go through that. We have three different parts, just like they're using the surgical checklist in that initial study. Um, our first one is, our first pause point is before induction of anesthesia. So this is our anesthesia technician, and they're just gonna run the checklist. So, so just some things on this list that we're trying to do, some real basic stuff, like confirm it's the right patient. Like it sounds, like you hear stuff on the news, like people operated on the wrong leg or all that kind of stuff. How does that stuff happen? I can see how it happens. Um, how we operate here, like today, I didn't, you just kind of just get rolling and just I'm kind of walking from operating room to operating room and we hope everybody's got their stuff in order. You know, everything was checked in, we're reading the right notes, or wasn't any typos on our referral letters, that kind of stuff. So we have this little pause point where we just make sure this is the right patient. We're doing the right procedure. We know it's left versus right. Um, blood work. Have they had any previous anesthesias? And if, this, if so, do they have complications? And then we can kind of tweak our protocol to try to avoid those complications during this episode. Um, we have a lot of airway stuff here, um, like a lot of brachycephalics and LARPARs. And so we have different protocols for that. So we just try to make sure we don't get halfway through the surgery and realize, oh, we should have been on that protocol for this bulldog. We go ahead and figure out on the front end. Um, we occasionally have cases that we know have the potential to bleed a bunch. And so we just make sure the hospital's got blood. And if we don't, then we're either calling in a donor dog to be ready or we delay the surgery. You know, we want to make sure you're prepared. The anesthesia monitoring equipment ready, we have three kind of places where the, the patients move. They go from knockdown, a lot of them go to radiology, in the operating room, then back to radiology. We just make sure those anesthesia machines in those places are already set up. That's the first part, pretty basic stuff. And the second part, this is the one I'm more familiar with. So this is when uh, we are about to make the incision in surgery. Basically, I walk in, and our technician will just basically present the case to the surgeon. So they'll say, this is so-and-so, and they'll give the signalment. This is the procedure that we're doing. If there's any, like, I thought this was a left leg, and you thought this was a right leg, we'll go back and look in the records. We'll go back and figure, make sure we are certain before we make that incision that we're all on the same page and we're doing the right thing. We always check, make sure the instruments um, are, are sterile. We try to figure out what's the critical part. So we have a lot of different people here that, that work together, but we all don't have to be in the room for the entire part of the surgery. If we know about 20 minutes into the surgery, it's gonna get a, everybody's going to start puckering up a little bit. 
then at 20 minutes in, everybody's going to start coming into the room, and we'll be ready for that. Does that make sense? It makes it more efficient, but also everybody's aware, okay, they're getting ready to start that diaphragmatic hernia. Let me kind of move back toward that room, get everybody ready. Also, make sure all the images are pulled up on the computer. That's, it seems like a very small thing, but it's huge. Sometimes we realize, oh, we actually didn't take x-rays, or maybe our computer system's down, and we need to bring in a laptop. And rather than wait 30 minutes for that to get figured out, we already know ahead of time what to do. This is the final one right before we walk, right before the surgeon walks out of the room. We just run through this one. This one's a little bit longer. We, we do a lot of the stuff actually during the procedure. We'll kind of check that list off, like what medications for post-operative care in ICU, what kind of medications are going to go home on. But some things that, that, are, that are big ones in my mind are, did we do everything we were going to do? Did we forget anything? Did we do a sponge count? Um, post-operative, we, we usually express their bladders, but sometimes we don't. We did a surgery where we don't want to put pressure on the abdomen, so we'll, we'll make sure they get a, a, a urinary catheter, or at least an intermittent urinary catheter. Um, and this helps us figure that out, what kind of bandage we want afterwards so the technicians can have it all set up or they can do it themselves. A big one near the bottom is who's going to call the owner. There is nothing like doing an awesome surgery, like it going fantastic, and then five hours later the owner calls furious because we forgot to call them. And, that's been a, and that turns into what should have been an awesome experience for them is a terrible experience. And then you guys hear about it, and it's, it's a problem. So um, just coordinated communication, this, this helps with that as well. Um, one thing we started using this for is um, instrument problems or like equipment problems. Historically, what we would do is we have just a few of the same like soft tissue packs and ortho packs, and I would get the same soft tissue pack, and it would be the same dull scissors. Or it would be like the, the worst needle driver you've ever seen. And I would complain about it for like two hours. And then I would move to the next surgery and totally forget about it. And then the next surgery day, open up that pack, and there are those terrible needle drivers right there again. And so what we've done is any problems with the instruments goes on this list. And if there's anything that's noted as a problem, it goes either to me or it goes to our equipment manager, and that problem gets solved. And so we're not doing the same thing over again. We can make sure we have the best instruments for each patient. To me, that's been a, a game changer. It's amazing how many instruments that we've had to replace, and now we're at a better, a better situation a year later. So 10 years ago, in 2009, when that study came out about checklists, um, some of the writers, everybody remember the show ER? So the writers for ER, they heard about the research that Dr. Kwande was doing and they gave him an opportunity to present it to 20 million people through ER. So there's an episode with a checklist. The second topic tonight is mental errors um, for, as far as causes of surgical complications. Um, mental errors are very common in everyday life. They're also very common in the sports world. Anybody remember this? I'm a huge Tar Heel fan, and so this was awesome. Uh, but this is Chris Weber uh, in the Michigan uniform. This is 1993. This is the NCAA uh, basketball championship game. Tar Heels versus Michigan's uh, Fab Five. They got 11 seconds left. Michigan's down by two. And Weber's dribbling the ball up the court, and Carolina traps him in the corner. So Weber, they, he thinks he's got, they've got one more timeout left. And so he calls it, calls a timeout. Unfortunately, he was wrong. Michigan had already used other timeouts. And so trying to call a timeout when you don't have any left as a technical foul, you get shots, you get the ball, game over. That ended the game. Chris Weber is a fantastic basketball player. He went on to play uh, in the pros for years. Um, Chris Weber is also a very smart guy. Um, he's on a lot of different talk shows. He's an analyst. Um, how could this happen? How could he make such a bad decision at such an important such an important game or point in his life? Um, and the, the answer is he didn't double check how many timeouts the team had. An unbelievable mental error. And so that, this is just an example. Um, he's got to live with that for the rest of his life, but nobody died. Nobody got hurt. He's a little embarrassed. His team's disappointed. But what happens when doctors make mental mistakes or mental errors? People don't really associate mental errors with hospital settings. At least I, I, I haven't. But, but they're very common. A hospital is a place where we constantly try to cope with uncertainty. There are, in my mind, kind of very few scenarios where we are certain or we should be certain. 
Um, we are constantly trying to make judgments on what we think is going on with the patients, what we think is the best treatment option. And whenever there is judgment, there's an opportunity for error or fallibility. I feel like we do this all the time. We're making judgment calls. This is what I would do. This is the treatment. This is 100%. Um, there's a lot of that kind of unknown stuff. And so we need to be careful um, when you're managing a patient, patient, you're working them up, and all of a sudden this one simple diagnosis kind of pops in your mind, and it kind of just beautifully explains all the things that you're seeing with that patient. That's when you kind of need to stop and check and just make sure you're not making some kind of mental error can this really be that simple of a thing? And it's not that the first thing that comes to mind is always wrong. It's just once you kind of throw out a diagnosis in your head, you kind of relax a little bit. You feel like you kind of have it under control. You get a little too confident, a little too sure that you know what's going on, and you kind of stop looking for other possible causes. This is, I think, a pretty good quote. Sometimes we are ignorant, not because we don't know something, but because we are certain that we do know it. Sometimes you can get so locked in that you know exactly what's going on that you can get tunnel vision, you can just completely be way wrong on it. And so that's when it's, it's just important um, to realize that being certain can sometimes be very dangerous. Uh, I'm not saying that you shouldn't be confident in your judgments and your, your decisions that you're making. I think you just, you just need to acknowledge uh, the presence of, of uncertainty in a lot of these cases. They're just not as clear-cut as sometimes we would like to think that they are. And so for mental errors, kind of in the 1970s again, uh, there were two Israeli psychologists, um, Daniel Kahneman and Amos uh, Tversky, that published this, just a series of joint papers in the 1970s. Um, anybody ever read the, the book The Undoing Project? It came out about a year ago. Michael Lewis wrote Moneyball. Pretty, pretty interesting book. It goes through a lot of stuff. It goes through, if you like sports, it goes through um, being a scout for NBA basketball and trying to figure out um, how people are selected or not and, and kind of going through mental errors um, with, with the selection process there. What, what these two guys touched on was they looked at how people dealt with uncertainty. And as we know, uncertainty is something we deal with on a daily basis in a hospital setting. We give percentages, we give odds to owners because we are uncertain. If we knew what was going to happen, we would just tell them, right? But a lot of times we say, oh, they got a 10% chance of having a problem with their incision, or they got a 20% chance of getting pancreatitis with this surgery. But we, we just don't know what's going on. We're having to give them odds of things. And so there's, there's some uncertainty there. Anybody ever had a case where the patient was misdiagnosed either by a colleague or by yourself where you thought you were just going down the right path and then later you realize you were way off just a completely different diagnosis I'll raise my hand I, t I totally do that sometimes unfortunately and, and here's, here's another book for you um, How Doctors Think and Misdiagnosis my thing should be a case right? by Dr. Groupman he's also out of the Harvard Medical School this is a book from 2008, or 2009, I should say. Um, it really sums up these mental errors that those other two um, psychologists started on, but kind of sums it up for the medical world. And what they kind of went through, um, I'll, we'll go over the four main um, mental errors that they see in, the, in, in working up cases. But what this guy stated was uh, misdiagnosis is remarkably common they estimated somewhere between 15 to 20 percent of all people are actually misdiagnosed. It's kind of scary. They also noted that in half of these cases, there is serious harm or even death to the, to the patient because of this misdiagnosis. They claim that uh, 80 percent of medical mistakes um, aren't necessarily technical errors. They, they actually result from predictable mental traps, what he called cognitive errors. And what they thought was the most significant um, determinant of if there's a, a medical mistake was how the doctor selects the clinical elements, weighs the importance, importance of them, and arranges them in their mind. So if I said, this is a case coming in, it has a fever, it's got, um, it's limping on its left rear leg, and it has a red blood count of like 25%. If we polled the room, I bet everyone would kind of have a little bit different or a lot different potential rule outs in their mind. Everybody kind of filters through those things. They kind of Think about, hmm, I had a case like that last week. It's probably similar to that. 
what they stated was doctors diagnose diseases based on pattern recognition. We draw those bits of information um, from the current patient and also from our past patients and kind of realize these patterns. We, we make these shortcuts in, in our minds to come up with the diagnosis. And so the four um, basic mental shortcuts that can lead to error, um, the first one is called anchoring. And that is where there's a tendency to kind of grab onto that first symptom or that first thing you hear about the patient, whether it be a physical exam finding, something the owner says, a lab abnormality. Um, you, can, you begin to develop in that, that first little bit of thinking, you kind of figure out what's going on with that patient right off the bat. And you kind of throw an anchor, you grab on or latch on to that initial impression. An example of how that can go awry, this is one of my own examples. Um, this is, uh, we had a two-year-old male neutered Labrador Retriever who presented for an appointment. On the chart, we always have like what the dog's coming over for, and it says it's coming over for a cruciate tear. So right then, I'm like, this dog's got a cruciate. It's a two-week history of a left rear leg lameness, and the lameness is getting worse over the past two weeks per the owner. And the dog presents, and he's totally touching, just barely toe touching on that back left leg. Now the dog isn't the nicest of dogs. He gets to wear a muzzle, and even with that muzzle, we're still we're still struggling to get a physical exam. Uh, we get only like a limit exam. I can kind of barely touch his back legs while he's standing, um, but but I can feel his I can feel his knees a little. Bit. I can feel that his left knee is thicker than his right knee. And when I try to get drawer, I think I get a little bit of drawer, but he's crying out and he seems really painful with doing that. He's just kind of freaking out. Sound familiar? That's the information I have on this patient. So I go in, I talk with the owners, and I tell them my findings. I tell them that most likely. Your dog has a cruciate tear. I kind of walk them through what that means, the different treatment options, the different surgical options. I talk to them about risk with anesthesia. I talk to them about the recovery from that, what it's going to be like in their house. I try to be as complete as I can with giving them as much information, trying to answer all their questions about cruciate tears. I even tell them that being a Labrador, they have a high chance that their dog's going to actually tear the other side within, within a year. I talked to them about how the dog's going to need, they were, they were interested in surgery, and I talked to them about how we're going to need some blood work and how we're going to need some x-rays on the knee. And that, due to the dog's behavior, we'll need to sedate the dog. And so what, they really weren't interested in sedating the dog that day and then coming back for surgery for anesthesia. So what they want to do is kind of combine them. And that's something that we commonly do here is the patient goes home um, on pain medications and rest, and then this dog came back the following week, and we got with a plan to go to surgery, but before we actually go to surgery, we're going to do a lot of that workup. So we get pre-medded, we get the blood work, it's perfectly normal. It goes under anesthesia, it gets a haircut, it gets an epidural, it rolls into radiology, and then our technician gives me a call. It says, Dr. Roach, can you check these x-rays before we roll into the operating room? It's a very normal morning for me. Somebody's always wanting me to look at x-rays. So I pull up the x-rays, and I see it. This dog has a bone tumor, right? It's got a proximal tibia. It's got a big old hole in, in, in the bone. In that moment, I'm like, how does this happen? How do I miss that? Um, we see knees all day, every day. I'm a board certified surgeon. How does that happen? And the answer is, it has to do with some mental shortcuts that I made during that workup of that case. I thought we knew more than we really did. Uh, from a practical sense, the way this was worked up, you know, this happens probably once a year, and we do probably 200 knees a year. Like it wasn't that big of a deal, but for this dog, for this moment, huge mistake. You got to just, in my mind, kind of just think through what you could have done different to to not miss that. It's a big shock, right? The owners think their dog's coming in for an ACL tear. They got a 90% chance of their dog being pretty near normal forever, and now you got a dog that got a pretty poor prognosis, two-year-old Labrador with a bone tumor. How that happens, trying to work through it, is just I made some mental shortcuts. Um, I kind of saw that little appointment thing that said coming in for a cruciate tear. I saw that dog toe touch, and I felt that one knee was thicker than the other, and I kind of just anchored on that, or I did anchor on that, and I didn't pursue it further. Uh, the second one, the second mental error, uh, the second of the four, is called availability error. And this is a tendency to assume that an easily remembered prior experience 
what is most readily ab- available in your mind, it can explain the new situation that you're trying to diagnose, the, the new patient that you're trying to diagnose. For instance, there are some weeks where I've done four TPLOs, a dog walks by me, and it's limping on his rear leg. That dog's got, that dog's got an ACL tear, no doubt, right? Another week, I, I get called in, I cut two foreign bodies in the middle of the night back to back. The next morning, a dog comes in, it's up on the screen, it's coming in for acute vomiting. 100% of the dog's got a foreign body, right? I've just kind of totally changed the odds of how things happen based on my prior experience. It, it is amazing how our minds can, can recalculate the odds of something happening uh, based on a prior event. Another example is me talking to owners prior to surgery, especially like on emergency. Uh, a great example would be if we've done a bunch of foreign bodies in a row and they've all go- gone great, um, when I'm talking to that owner, I definitely mention that there's a risk of leakage, but I don't emphasize it. Kind of just keep going through the spill, kind of keep just you know talking about three weeks of rest afterward, wear an e-collar, they don't learn from the mistake, that kind of stuff. But with my last patients, or a patient in the recent future, uh, when I did an intestinal surgery and it had a leakage from that, you better bet I'm going to talk for about 15 minutes to that owner and make sure they understand that it's possible that if we do an intestinal surgery of any type, there's a chance it could leak and that could be terrible. Does that sound familiar? You guys do that? You just totally change the odds in your mind of something happening. Um, when in reality, in both of those scenarios, the risk of having a leakage from the intestines is the same, right? It's just how I think about it. The third mental error is called confirmation bias. And this is once you have a diagnosis or you've thrown down an anchor, even if there's information that comes out later about that patient that totally contradicts your initial anchor, your initial diagnosis, we tend to discount it or rationalize it as not being important. In general, the human mind tends not to see things it does not expect to see and vice versa. We sometimes try to fit the evidence to the theory rather than the theory to the evidence. So here's an example of me doing confirmation bias. So we recently had a little Pomeranian and it presented after being hit by a car and it had pelvic fractures. We took chest, ac- chest x-rays and they were normal. We took abdominal x-rays. They're a little tough to read because the dog had some wounds over its abdomen, <coughs> but we think we saw a bladder. Uh, someone also took a probe and scanned the abdomen and there was, there was minimal free fluid. Um, the x-ray showed no obvious spinal fractures. Um, this, this little Pomeranian was pretty painful uh, and didn't really want to walk. So we placed a urinary catheter while he's waiting for surgery. Pretty common for us. I think the ICU technicians love it when we place urinary catheters. Something mess with them. So the next day, we took him to surgery, and we repaired his pelvis, and it went great. The next day, the dog was up, actually trying to walk. Seemed a lot more comfortable. And so we removed his urinary catheter. About 18 hours later, in the middle of the night, the folks in the ICU, they called to alert me that the patient hadn't urinated since we pulled that urinary catheter. And me being awesome in the middle of the night on the phone, I tell them, <laughs> I told them to just check his bedding for urine. I'm sure they've missed it. I'm sure he's, wa- I'm sure he's urinated. Walk him more frequently. Uh, increase his IV, IV fluid rate. I'm sure he's probably just dehydrated, hasn't filled up his bladder yet. Um, at the 24 hour mark, still no urine. One of the ICU technicians noticed the patient's abdomen is becoming more distended. And so they scan the belly and it's full of fluid and there's no visible bladder on the ultrasound. So this dog has a ruptured bladder, so likely from the hit by car, right? Um, he's been in our hospital for nearly three days. He's had a major operation. He's about to go home, actually. And we just figured out in the middle of the night, this dog also has a bladder rupture. How, how does that happen? I know that dogs with pelvic fractures are at risk of rupturing their bladder and their urethra. I think it's somewhere like a 15% chance, something like that. I latched on to that vague information that we thought we saw a bladder on the x-ray, that we scanned the abdomen and we didn't have any free fluid. I just latched onto that, that the bladder was okay, and I just moved on. And then trying to, even as this information was coming to me a couple of days later, I just didn't understand it. I couldn't comprehend that we may have a bladder rupture. I had already moved on in my mind. And so this new information came in that contradicted my diagnosis, and I just discounted it. Anybody ever done anything like that? I think it happens more often than you think. I think you just may not get burned as badly as as some of these. But with surgery, a lot of times you make errors and it can be a big deal. So the fourth one is called attribution error, the fourth and the last one. 
Um, it's a tendency to mentally invoke a stereotype um, attribute sim and attribute symptoms to this stereotype. Examples um, would be a patient that's assumed to be cage aggressive in your hospital. People, he's cage aggressive, you can't really mess with him, but maybe he's actually just painful, right? You just kind of discount that. He could actually be painful. It's just a behavior thing. Or if you have a cat in the hospital that doesn't want to eat, it's just a cat in the hospital that doesn't want to eat. It's not that he's actually sick and anorexic, right? Same thing can happen with owners. Sometimes you have good owners. You know, they're friends of yours or they've, they've been great over the years, and you, you maybe don't ask those difficult questions. Are you really restricting your dog? You know, are you, it sounds like you, the way you're talking, it sounds like they're maybe running around, but I don't want to ask you specific questions about that. I don't want it to be mean. Uh, I have this stereotype that you're a good owner. So those are kind of four things, anchoring, availability error, confirmation bias, attribution error, that I find that, th this was out of, out, of that, out of that book, but I find it's something I do frequently, and I try to just realize I'm doing it and then make the correction. What that author uh, Dr. Groupman recommended is once you have a diagnosis, ask yourself three questions to stay on track. The first one is, what else could it be? Is there, is there something else it could be? Number two would be, could two things be going on at once? There's, there's a study out there that I had to memorize for boards that was 20% of dogs with spinal fractures have a second spinal fracture. Can you imagine if you missed that? You went in and repaired that first spinal fracture and you just moved on and that dog has a second spinal fracture that you miss and becomes paralyzed. So could, could two things be going on at once? The third question was, have you found anything in your physical exam, your lab results, your imaging, anything that's maybe not in sync with your diagnosis? And then pursue it, not discount it, but pursue it. Just make sure that it, something else is not going on. So for the second part, um, I kind of came up with four things that I, that I kind of do in my um, preparation for patients in surgery. The, th the third one is to, if I'm having trouble, I always think about trying to increase my exposure, trying to make that surgery easier somehow. Before, we were kind of doing a lot of theory, talking about mental mistakes, doing checklists. and this, we're going to get into more technical stuff. Possibly maybe what you thought this was going to be about all along is, is just talking about making it technically easier. Sometimes we don't know the, the proper technique. Maybe we're, we're ignorant, but most commonly it's because we know the technique, but we just don't make the little adjustments, the little tweaks that can make the procedure possible or, or easier. And so we're going to try to go through some little tweaks of things. And if you've experienced something that we're going to talk about and you have a, a better way of doing it, please pipe in or chime in. And, and I'm, I'm eager to learn. I learned a new thing like two weeks ago, and it is... Every time, I, and I'll just smile every time I do it. I don't know why I haven't been doing this my whole life or my whole career. But where I got this increase your exposure, this was a little nugget I picked up during my residency at Georgia. There's a, there's a surgeon there named Chad Schmidt. He does their kidney transplants there. He was also the drummer in our band. We're, we're good friends. Um, but, but he would always say, and he had, he had great hands, probably one of the best surgeons I've ever been around. He had certainly had flaws and stuff, but just like pure surgery, just the, the smoothest hands, and, and it was just always amazing. But if you're having trouble, he would always say, just make your incision bigger. Just ex increase your exposure. Nine times out of ten, it's just going to make the surgery easier. That's something I've always tried to do. Sometimes it takes me 20 minutes to kind of realize, oh, I just need to make my incision bigger, or I just need to change how I'm looking at this, and suddenly it becomes much more easier to do rather than just keep, keep beating your head against the wall trying to make something happen at surgery that's just not going to happen in the way that you're currently doing it. Um, if you're having trouble during abdominal surgery, make that incision bigger. Don't be afraid to make that incision from the xiphoid to the pubis. We see occasionally some cases that, that come over, they've been explored and there's been some trouble you know, going on with that procedure, but the incision's about that long in a Labrador. There's just no way, at least for me, there's no way I can operate on anything complicated in the abdomen through a teeny incision. Um, I would highly recommend just open them up um, the, uh, as we all know, incisions heal side to side, right? They don't heal end to end. So it doesn't matter if it's a little teeny incision or a big incision. It still takes two weeks to heal. Everybody, everybody get that? You can also extend your abdominal incision um, into like a pericostal incision. If you're having some, some problem or you're having surgery, you're working on like the kidneys, 
We had a dorsal diaphragmatic hernia, super tough place to work, adrenal glands, stuff like that. And you just struggle to get to those areas through a ventral midline incision, especially with everything in the way. And so you can have five people scrub in with you and try to get a hand in there and retract, or you can just take your incision and just take it right down behind that last rib on either side. And what that does, you take it all the way down to the gutter. And that just kind of opens everything up, and you're just right on that kidney, right on that adrenal gland, right on that diaphragm. That was still a very challenging surgery, but there was no way I was going to get that the other way. So just increasing your exposure, increase your incision, um, it, can, it can dramatically change how that surgery goes. And sometimes you get in scenarios where you actually can increase your incision. Maybe the patient's in the wrong position, or maybe you didn't drape it wide enough to make your incision bigger. Maybe you didn't more commonly, maybe you didn't clip the hair wide enough to make your incision bigger and you're kind of stuck. And so that's why you kind of you have a, a checklist and you need to be prepared for what if plan A doesn't work? What's plan B? And can we already be prepared to convert to plan B before we need it? Does that, does that make sense? Here's the thing that I figured out a couple weeks ago and I'll share with you. Um, any surgery in the mid to cranial abdomen that I think we're going to have any difficulty with we're not talking about gastrotomies or anything like that. We're talking about like big liver masses, anything where it's going to be pretty challenging. What I have done in the past is um, I'll have the, the anesthesia machine, I'll have the patient's head, then their abdomen, and then I put the instrument table behind them. And I just stand on the side. I'm left-handed, so I stand on the patient's left side. And then what do, we, what do you do? You crank your head around. You have somebody retract. You try to like look up at the diaphragm, look up at the liver. And it can be pretty challenging. It can certainly just from a physical standpoint, kind of exhaust you to do some of those cases when you're kind of leaning over. So what I've been doing, or we just did kind of modify it, is anything where mid to cranial abdomen is going to be tough, I take the patient table, I just move it up over their head, over the patient's head, so it goes anesthesia machine, surgery table, and then have the patient, and have the patient's butt right at the end of the table. Very similar like a knee surgery, except you just push the table further towards the anesthesia machine. And so what that allows you to do um, especially in smaller dogs, is you can stand off the back of the table and just work. Like you would, it's very, way more natural than working from the side when you're looking up at the diaphragm. Does that make sense? Another part of increasing your exposure is retraction. Um, if you have an assistant, use them. I know there's scenarios where there's not an assistant available. Um, so you want to use self retracting instruments like a Balfour, a Balfour or a Lone Star retractor. Um, those things can be invaluable if you're doing abdominal explorers. Everybody familiar with a Lone Star Retractor? This is my friend. This is the Lone Star Retractor. It just comes in a little pack. It has these little four pieces that you put together. You lag screw them together. It's pretty cool. And then you have these what I call worms. It looks like a little fishing worm with a hook on the end. There's little grooves in the plastic pieces, and you can just take the hook of your little worm, attach it to the skin, and you pull it tight and put it through one of these little notches. This thing is great. Anything, uh, we do them on like, a, like ear surgery, anything around the butt, like perineal hernias, anal sac stuff. It just, that thing just sticks up there by itself and you can just add as many worms as you want on there. It is great. PU surgeries, it's fantastic. Highly recommend it. And it, it, it's not expensive at all. Another big thing um, that can help you with surgery, anytime you're working in a, like a cavity or a deep hole, you need suction. I should say, you don't gotta have it, but you need suction. I worked in places that we didn't have suction. Fortunately, that was kind of the front end of my career. I don't think I could go back. Suction's so helpful, especially in the admin. You just can't work underwater. If you can't see what you're doing, you're gonna miss something. You're just not gonna be at your best. And so I think that's a great addition. You get those little portable suction canisters. Uh, we used to have them here, and, and they're definitely not that expensive. My last tip, kind of the four things that the, you know, one was the checklist, uh, mental errors, increasing your exposure, and then the last thing is just re review. Um, follow your cases out, evaluate their results, critique what you did, and get better for the next patient. Not just in surgery or veterinary medicine, but like sports and stuff. I think it's very helpful to try to figure out, man, that was a terrible play. How do I not do that again? How do I, you know, just, just kind of evaluate yourself. I think that's what all the great athletes do. And I think it can translate into uh, surgery as well. I'm also a big fan of reviewing cases with your colleagues. I know that can be a very uncomfortable thing, is talking about your mistakes. But I think it's, it's really important. Um, it is pretty common for us to be autonomous, to I do my thing, you do your thing, we kind of coexist 
rather than work together. And so here, for a little over a year, the surgeons here at MVS, we, we meet once a month. And it's just the three of us. And we just go over our complications. Some months we don't have much, and some months we got a lot. We just do a ton of, ton of surgery. That stuff just happens. We just go over our complications. We present cases as an M&M rounds type scenario. We'll share our ideas on how I would do this if this was my case or just give different perspectives. We don't do it to shame each other. We, we just do it to get better. It's something we've been doing for the past year, and I think it's been great. And so I would encourage you all, if you have that opportunity at your hospital or if you have friends in the the veterinary world, I think it's a great thing. If you're wanting to truly get better, you've got to critique yourself. You've got to figure out what went wrong and how do you prevent it from happening in the future. One of the um, doctors at, uh, I think it's the University of Minnesota, they have a cystic fibrosis clinic that is routinely, has some of the best outcomes in the world for cystic fibrosis. The, one of the doctors there is Warren Warwick. He's the director of that program. And he talks about how important it is to acknowledge that we fail. It says it's how we get better. It's how we go from being just competent to being excellent. Just review your performance. Anybody know Dr. Crawwinkle, University of Tennessee? I did a one-year internship up there, and I fortunately got to scrub in a lot with him. And, and he would walk out of pretty much every surgery, and he would be telling someone, be telling one of the nurses, if that instrument, if we could do, do a little tweak here, we could, we could just, you know, he would be constantly critiquing, how could we do this better next time? And somebody would be taking notes. And I just thought that was just so amazing. Like he just constantly reviewing. And the next time he'd come in and it would be different. He would have already moved to that next step. He was a better surgeon next time. So in summary, the four things um, in my process that I, what I use to try to avoid surgical complications, and I assure you it does, my complication rate is not zero, but I feel like I'm, I'm moving a step where I'm not missing some of the things I did in my past. Number one, use a surgical checklist. It's worth the extra 60 seconds of your time. Number two, be aware of those common mental errors or common mental traps when you're thinking about your cases. The anchoring, the availability error, the confirmation bias, the attribution error, those four things. If you're having trouble in surgery, uh, doing the procedure, be thinking about how you can increase your exposure. And then four, uh, what we just talked about was review your cases. Sometimes the reason you're not doing well in this case is because you didn't learn from the previous case. I was hoping that if people wanted to talk about different cases or different types of surgeries, maybe something they have uh, a tip for everybody else or they've had complications or, or struggle with and they want to kind of go through it. These are my sources. This is probably the only presentation I've ever given where I gave books as like a source, but it's, it's really fun reading some, through some of the books. Um, but, but I have you know, some basic stuff like surgical complications. If you want to talk about you know, bleeding, infection, dehiscence, anything with anesthesia we can go through. Surgery specific complications. I've got a couple slides on, on different systems if anybody wants to go through. Does anybody have anything, any comments or any thoughts? Hopefully I've broken the ice by talking about a few of my terrible cases. You know, some of our dentistries we seem to have problems with hypotension. Um, hypotension. Um, where we tend to see it, or where I tend to see it the most, where it's kind of unexpected, is you have a very stable foreign body patient. And so like, we'll come in, get called in, and it's just like, let's just go. Let's cut this case. And the dog seems like it's doing very well. You get them under anesthesia, and they got no blood pressure. They're doing terrible. And, and for those cases, what I've learned, or what I try to do is we give them a ton of fluids on the front end before we knock them out. Everybody just take a break. Everybody do something else. Let's get them rehydrated as best we can. So for me, when I think hypotension, I think hypovolemia. That's a big cause. Um, coming, coming through, what I was kind of trained to do, as long as it's kind of a straightforward case with no heart issues, is give them uh, up to three crystalloid boluses, 10 mils per kg or 5 mils per kg. Um, if they're not responding to that, then we used to go to head of starch or vet starch, go to colloid to help with pressures. And I think in the past year or so, talking with some of the criticalists here, that's kind of fallen out of favor. Instead of going to like a colloid, uh, then, then we go to pressure. We a lot of dopamine. Dobutamine is kind of the next step here. But the, the question is, why is that hap happening? Um, for me, hypovolemia is that step. And then try to find other reasons for that. Sometimes temperature. Um, some of our cases that take a lot, of, a lot of prep, like ear surgeries for one, they're sitting out there for an hour under anesthesia, and they just get cold. And I want to say for every, what is it, for every drop in the temperature by two degrees, 
you have to back off your ISO by so many percentage points, something like that. So maybe less gas as well. Isofluorine is the most dangerous thing in the room. The surgeon is the second most dangerous thing in the room. That's, that's always kind of stuck with me. It's true, um, you know, just like Marty's saying, just having the gas. And so a lot of times those dogs that we're prepping for a while, they may not have full monitoring on, and we just kind of have the gas set at a certain setting, whether it be one and a half, something like that. And then we get in the operating room, they get fully monitored, and we realize, oh, they're hypotensive. In my mind, I'm thinking, they were probably hypotensive out there as well. We're just maybe not checking as closely. Um, I worked at Georgia. We had a baby, I think it was a baby cooker. That's a little thing you can kind of bring over the patient, and it would just put this immense heat on them, just try to keep them warm. But yeah, in, anything to keep them, uh, keep their temperature up, will definitely help with your blood pressures um, in, in in surgery or in the OR. I usually give a little talk to the interns each year. What we talked about a little bit earlier about you come up with the diagnosis, and you kind of forget to look for other problems. You, can, you kind of anchor on there. And I think hit by cars. That's a very common thing that we see. I assume you guys see them as well. Um, it's something where you, in my mind, you have to actively look for problems. What typically happens, especially with some of our newer interns, these guys are, these guys are seasoned, they're doing great, but some of our newer interns is that dog comes in, got that broken tibia, and it's just that nasty dangling leg hanging there, and that's all they can focus on is that dangling leg, right? Um, it's just nasty. It might even have a little open wound there, and they just lock in. But hit by cars can have so many other problems. If they're getting hit by enough force to break their leg, they can do all kinds of other things. And so I kind of go through a little checklist in my head um, to just kind of make sure I'm not missing something. So first, are they stable? Yes, I understand they have a broken leg. I, I get it. Let's put a little blanket over that and let's just check the rest of the patients. Are they stable? Let's get some vital signs. Let's get a blood pressure. Also look and see um, you know, the, the chest. That's a big thing. Do they have a pneumothorax? Do they rupture their lung? Do they have pulmonary contusions? Do they have a diaphragmatic hernia? And it's, it's not that they're going to come in necessarily having difficulty breathing or they're going to come in with a little, a little label on them, hi, I have a pneumothorax. Right? You have to act actually have to take that x-ray or listen to their chest to figure that out. And so I kind of just run through those things, like are they stable? How do the lungs look? Do they, do they have a diaphragmatic hernia? Is their bladder ruptured? Just like in that other case, um, I know like there's somewhere around a 15% chance of having some type of urinary tract rupture with pelvic fractures. And so we need to take that next step, not just look at the x-ray of the pelvic fractures, but go, all right, I need to figure out if this dog has ruptured his bladder or is urethra, and a lot of times we'll do a contrast study on those dogs to prove it's ruptured or it's not. Dogs that break one leg, one of the first things that I'm asking is, can they walk on the other three legs? Because if they can't, something else is going on. There might be some initial shock and stuff, but if they're stable, they should be able to walk on the other three legs. And if they can't, you need to figure that out before you go and operate that broken leg. Do they have a spinal injury? And then also look for wounds. Um, sometimes we kind of, like, oh, he's got road rash, you kind of just generalize the wounds. Yeah, they've got road rash. They also have a big hole in, over here, and we need to pursue that. That's going to, excuse me, that's going to take priority over fixing this, this tibia fracture. If that wound happened to just go into the abdomen, or if that wound's actually going to get infected later, and then now your implants are getting infected. So it's just something, uh, like hit by cars, is just, I cannot, I cannot work emergency, because I would just be like, <laughs> just pursuing every little thing. But I can assure you, the last thing you want to do is operate a dog and then later realize that you missed something. And so you kind of try to learn from those mistakes and you pursue these things. You've got to actively pursue them, um, something that's associated with the injury. Um, an another one would be, do you guys do a lot of cystotomies for bladder stones? How many of you take x-rays afterwards to confirm you got all the stones? But you just need to confirm that you, that you got them all. You can take out 99 stones, but that 100 stones still in there, and it's going to block that male dog, and they're going to be at home when it happens, I assure you, and it's going to be a problem. I think there's a fine line between like, letting owners kind of dictate what happens. I guess the other end would be telling them this was going to happen. For me, I think a lot of it's just trying to educate owners. Try to not force it on them, but just try to reset their perspective. You have a ton of problems sometimes with people that don't want amputations. They'd rather euthanize their dog and get an amputation. I had a dog, uh, I think it's still in the hospital, I think it'll be operated tomorrow. The dog came in for a femur fracture and they wanted to euthanize the dog. 
You know, just just got to. Um, I think that's a client education problem. Euthanizing dogs for a problem with one of their legs. That's not something I'm I'm necessarily in, in favor of. Dogs are three-legged animals with a spare leg, um, in my mind. And so I think in the in the heat of the moment, the owners are making these big decisions when they don't have to. Usually an injury to one leg is not life-threatening. Now, they might have other things, but if they're otherwise stable, you don't have to make a decision right then. I know this past week, you just talked to some emergency doctors, like, tell them to go home, get some dinner, go think about it. We're going to want some pain meds. It's just going to be totally fine if they decide the same thing tomorrow. Just let's take 24 hours to just think about it before you put your dog down. I mean, like I said, I realize I'm removed from some of this stuff, but I think a lot of it's so that's just client, just client education. People just don't realize um, they're they're just not informed on, on some things that you can you can definitely help them get through. I got some categories: bladder surgery, gastrointestinal, stifle, fractures, splenectomies, diaphragmatic hernias. Yeah, and, and just to kind of touch on on the implant part, uh, I don't feel in the mid '90s the TPLO came out um, and it was patented um, by Slocum. He's the guy that that invented it, and you had to go take his <coughs> You had to go take his course before you were allowed to do that procedure. And all the implants was made, there were Slocum implants. Well, they didn't do the research on that. And those implants started causing bone tumors at a much higher rate than other implants. And so you'll find some owners that have done some research and they've seen that somewhere on the internet or something like that. And you just need to know, like, those implants have been, those are, they're off the shelf, they're banned. Nobody uses those implants anymore. So that might help with that part of it. As far as getting infected, that can, that's true with, that's a potential for any implants, um, whether it be a lateral suture or a bone plate and screws. Um, if you've got a foreign material under the skin, there is at least some risk that's going to get infected sometime in the future and may need to come out to resolve it. So I think, in my mind, kind of two different things. So infection, I think we give owners somewhere between 5 or 10% chance of having an infection um, during the, the recovery period. Um, for ACL, or we do TPLOs and TTAs mainly here, somewhere between five to ten percent. Um, and so the way I think about that is, um, I'm going to do, I'm going to do ten TPLOs in the next couple of weeks. That means at least one of the per, one of the owners I was talking to, that's going to happen to their dog. Like if you believe in in odds, you know, ten percent or five percent is not zero. That's happening to somebody's dog. And so, to me, it's, it's a real thing, and, and it's, it can seem like there's a, there's a run of them happening, and sometimes that's true. Sometimes it's just not understanding random, randomness. And, and if that, if, I'm not sure if that makes sense or not, but, um, but a 5% chance is not, not zero. And we definitely see some, and, and we're talking about infections. One, it could be the implant wasn't sterile. Two, we could have had contamination during the procedure. Three, they didn't get their antibiotics appropriately. Um, the biggest cause in my mind by far, the dog licks the incision um, during that first kind of 10 days when they should be wearing that e-collar. They have some issues. And if there's, in, if there's any kind of hint in infection during that first kind of two weeks, you usually can go away with some antibiotics and put an e-collar on them. But those dogs have a much higher chance later down the road to present with a, an infection of that implant later on. So if, if a dog has any problems with their incision, we try to communicate with those owners that this is, pro this is probably still going to go very well, but we might take that implant out later on once the bone heals. And that is the beauty of like a TPLO. Um, TTA is a little bit harder to get out. I don't know if you are involved in any of those, but a little bit harder. Um, but that's the beauty of that type of surgery is once that bone heals, you can take those implants out. They don't serve a purpose anymore versus if you have a, like a prosthetic ligament in and thing is infected, you take that out and then you've got an ACL tear again. But as far as infections go, that's something we're always worried about when we're putting implants in. It's definitely a, a possibility that it's going to cause a problem in the short term and also in the long term. Big things for stifles for me is um, a, a lot of folks, a lot of folks I've worked with, they look at the ACL and they repair it if it's torn. They don't look at the meniscus. Um, it's, it's been shown that uh, in some recent studies that the meniscus can be torn in up to 40% of dogs with ACL tears. And if you have a dog that has, an, has a meniscal tear, that lameness probably is not going to go away when you do a TPLO or you do a lateral suture. Um, you need to look for those other problems. You know, they have an ACL tear, but do they have something else? 
And for meniscal tears, it's very common. So you need to actively pursue that. You need to look at that meniscus. It's almost always going to be um, the medial meniscus and the caudal pole of that. And it's been shown to just looking at it, you're going to pick up on most of them, but you're going to miss some. What they recommend is using a little probe. We use a, like a depth gauge or a little um, nerve probe to just feel that caudal pole and see if it you can kind of if it has a little longitudinal tear. Um, fortunately, most commonly when they tear their meniscus, it flips forward and that bucket handle tear. But it's just really important to evaluate the meniscus. That's going to I'm talking about success rates. If you don't look for the meniscus, and 40% of them have meniscal tears, you're going to have a lot of dogs that don't do that do really well, and you're going to be questioning. Like, man, I must not be able to do a TPLO surgery very well or a lateral suture very well when, in fact, maybe you're doing it great and you're just menis missing the meniscal tears. Um, historically, it was, it's was it been shown to just grab the submucosa with your bites. Don't get any suture in the bladder. And the idea was that it could lead to stone formation or uh, issues with the, with the healing process. Is that what you're saying? And then there's a study more recently showing that that's not a big deal. I, I think I read that study. I agree, and, and I'll tell you the biggest thing is making sure, I mean, the, the mucosa and the submucosa are intimately associated with each other on almost any tissue. We divide it in two layers, but it's really, practically it's one layer. So f from my standpoint, and the way I was taught, I don't hesitate to get a full thickness bite. I don't know of, of issues that I've had in the past with that. Maybe you didn't get good bites. Maybe it was just the seromuscular layer that you call it with your sutures and maybe it's not strong enough. Or too, sometimes when we have dogs that have obstructions and we do cystotomies, like their, their bladder's not very healthy sometimes. And in those cases, if I don't think the bladder's very healthy, we will leave a urinary catheter in for 12 to 24 hours, something like that. To me, the, bla the bladder is kind of like the stomach. It's one of those organs that just wants to heal in general. And if you can get good bites, we, we normally do a simple, or I normally do a simple continuous, and then I'll leak test it. If there's any hint of little leakage, then I'll invert it. But there are some recent studies showing the simple continuous is just as less likely to, the same likeliness of leaking as if, if you did a two-layer closure. There's all kinds of studies looking at how long sutures last um, in the body and then how long they last in infected fluids. So like if you have, suppose like an E. coli, if a suture material is exposed to E. coli, it lasts like four days versus three weeks kind of stuff. And I don't know how practical those, those things are. I don't know. I would say the majority of dogs that we operate on their bladder, they probably have a urinary tract infection. But I think it's extremely rare. I mean, it's possible that maybe that was part of it. And then it sounds like you're already leak testing it. I think that's huge. I think the biggest thing on that is like taking that post-op x-ray, just making sure you know there's nothing left in there. And you can just relax a little bit. But uroabdomen is definitely a possible complication of a cystotomy. This is something just talking about the inner on the front end of it. This is a possible complication. Um, as long, I, I have found that when we get into kind of a, a really weird situation with the owners, it's in some situation where I have not presented it, that possibility to them on the front end of it. When I meet with owners, I'm in there for a while. Like, I try to talk to them and just try to be like, not trying to be negative Nancy, but let's just run through some of these things. Would you be okay with the possibility of this happening, like a Euro abdomen where we might have to reoperate that bladder? You know, just kind of go ahead and throw it out there so when those things do happen, we didn't want it to happen, but we at least talked about it. That seems to go over a lot easier than we're like, what? I didn't know you could do You know, It's just a, I find it very helpful to do that. Hey, thank you all for hanging in there. Appreciate it.